Good day and welcome to the Center for Research Libraries webinar on the Human Rights Electronic Evidence Assessment Project. Uh, this uh, webinar is going to be about an hour long uh, and for those of you who have logged into the computer uh, you've uh, seen already that you need to dial in to hear the audio through the phone. Uh, so we have muted all of the participants who have joined in so that we don't get a lot of background noise. Um, if you, uh, towards the end of the, the um, session, we'll have the opportunity to uh, chat over the phone and you can press star six to unmute your line at that point. Uh, but we will keep it silent uh, just in, so that uh, people coming into your office uh, or your phone ringing won't disturb the rest of the participants. We do invite you to send questions or comments via the chat function uh, on the, uh, the WebEx um, form there that you see online. You can send a message uh, privately to us and we will respond to it or clarify our comments as we, uh, as we can. So uh, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to do this uh, with us today. Uh, we are, we're very excited to present some of the findings of our electronic evidence assessment project. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. My name is James Simon. I'm the Director of International Resources. Uh, and we have three presenters who will be discussing today uh, some of our findings. Uh, I will be presenting uh, towards the end. Sarah Van Dusen Phillips, who's our project coordinator on the program, uh, will also be reporting on, on some of her findings. And Marie Waltz, our special projects manager, uh, will, will be addressing. Here's the agenda for uh, the next hour. Uh, for uh, about 10-15 uh, minutes, we'll be discussing the nature of electronic evidence, uh, some of the significant uh, developments in electronic evidence over the past uh, decade or so. Sarah Van Dusen Phillips will talk about the regional assessments that we performed uh, and the, w the findings from the field. And I'll round it up with a discussion of the life cycle of electronic evidence and the uses of that material. We'll have 10 or 15 minutes uh, for a conversation, if all goes well. Uh, and I do remind you to send your comments in via chat or wait till the end. Thank you. Just a little bit of background to the project. In 2008, the Center for Research Libraries received a grant from uh, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation uh, as a result of a series of conversations between human rights practitioners, academic institutions, and policymakers regarding the, um, the, the uses and the ability to collect documentation in physical and electronic form. Uh, we're very grateful for the support that MacArthur Foundation has given us. Uh, and this was originally intended to be a two-year project, which uh, as um, technology continued to evolve, uh, stretched out into a three-year assessment. The objectives of the project, as you see on your screen, uh, were to assess the practices and technologies used by local and regional monitoring groups and activists to create and collect documentation of, uh, from electronic media, uh, social networks, uh, from uh, electronic capturing devices such as cell phones, video cameras, and the like, and using that material in, uh, to document human rights abuses and violations. The second part of the assessment was to uh, look at how they were using it and whether the documentation practices and tools were adequate in supporting their work in advocacy or in investigations or reparations, um, legal proceedings in, in local or international levels. As part of this uh, uh, assessment, we sought to uh, identify best practices of organizations, uh, whether it was in the collection of information, the organization of it, uh, or, or in the, the long-term storage of it, and to encourage support and collaboration um, among human rights organizations, academic institutions, and other archives, uh, whether they are regional, national, or international archives. As part of our assessment, we surveyed uh, numerous organizations uh, to examine their practices, the tools they used, uh, what they were making available publicly or privately, uh, and to, to look at essentially the flow of information uh, from the capturing of the electronic documentation through its end use, uh, such as uh, um, affecting policy change or use in a trial um, or, or creating a final report. So the types of organizations that we surveyed included both um, U.S. Uh, nonprofit organizations uh, or large international organizations, those organizations that worked um, both here in the United States and internationally, 
We also looked at a significant component which uh, relates to human rights is the academic and research organizations that function in collecting uh, documentation and supporting work of human rights organizations, um, such as the University of Texas at Austin, Columbia University, uh, and independent research projects like the Web Ecology Project. Uh, we did survey uh, numerous uh, human rights organizations in the field, including um, about 10 or so in each of the uh, countries listed here, Mexico, Rwanda, and Russia. Uh, these were, were areas of strategic interest both to CRL as well as to the MacArthur Foundation, um, and were uh, engaging in significant documentation activity worth, uh, worth studying. The organizations, there's a, actually a question on the chat already, how did we decide upon the organizations? Uh, the organizations were assessed based on uh, recommendations both from the MacArthur Foundation, uh, from the, the partners that we originally engaged as part of our um, proposal to the MacArthur Foundation, uh, and through additional solicitation uh, among our, our members and experts that uh, work in these fields. Also, in some cases, it was a bit of um, which organizations were available at the time. We found often that once we arrived in the field uh, that um, uh, we discovered a number of organizations that were, didn't previously appear on our radar. Or conversely, there were organizations that were not um, able to um, meet with us at that time. So it was a bit flexible at the time, but uh, we, we sought to cover a wide range of organizations, both from the smallest grassroots uh, to some of the large national institutions. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Marie Waltz, who's going to um, give some of the background to the types of evidence that we're discussing uh, and provide some uh, interesting case studies that would help uh, demonstrate what it is exactly that we're talking about. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marie Waltz. I'm a special projects librarian at the Sefer Research Libraries. And I've been looking at the types of human rights electronic evidence that are being created. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about them today. But to start, I want to start with a story about a particular piece of film footage that was shot by the British reporter Nick Hughes in Rwanda at the start of the genocide in 1994. Mr. Hughes was an independent cameraman who happened to be in Kakanda at the start of the 100-day massacre of the Tutsis by the Hutu. He captured film footage of a the murder of a father and his daughter. The capture of this powerful piece of evidence was not planned in advance by Mr. Hughes, but he knew what to do when he saw what was happening. He put his camera in a good location, monitored his equipment, and captured an event that witnesses, including UN soldiers, were powerless to prevent. The event that was documented was the murder of a man and his daughter. The event was captured on film. It is grainy and shot from a distance, but it clearly shows the events taking place. The victims are kneeling and praying. The men are violently striking them with wooden clubs. One can see these men strike to kill. In the background are the sounds of those near the camera witnessing the event in disbelief. After capturing the footage, Mr. Hughes quickly delivered this footage worldwide via his distributor, WTN. WTN sold the footage to CNN, Australian Broadcasting, and ZDF soon after the event took place. Having the resources to get the story out, both his own skills as a cameraman and his connections to new larger news organizations, is important for getting the word out. This news footage was the first time the global community was exposed to the genocide that was occurring inside Rwanda. It did not stop the atrocities from con continu continuing, though it did provide evidence of what was occurring in a largely uninformed world audience. Informing the world of human rights abuse is an important function of human rights evidence. The footage was used again in 1998. It was entered as Exhibit 467 in the trial of George Rutaganda, the Vice President of the Rwandan Hutu Militia. Mr. Rutaganda, a radio announcer and a leader of the Hutu Militia, was identified as a key figure in the genocide. He encouraged Hutus to abuse and kill Tutsis during the Rwandan genocide. Mr. Hughes' film and his testimony were entered as evidence in Mr. Rutaganda's trial before the International Cr Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Mr. Rutaganda was convicted and sent to prison. Authentic evidence of what occurred at the time of the event is important for admission as trial evidence and is often the goal of human rights evidence gathering. The provenance or chain of custody for the Gokanda footage is without question. In 2003, Alan Thompson, a Canadian reporter and Carleton University professor, became interested in the footage for his own research purposes. He was editing a book about what happened to the media during the Rwandan genocide. He contacted Mr. Hughes, who sent him a copy of the footage on mini-DVD. He had the footage converted to a WAV file for his laptop, which he showed continuously to a number of people in his classes and on his book tour helping to spread his message that the media failed to report what had happened in Rwanda. 
In 2004, Thompson was visiting Rwanda and went to the street where the event took place. He located witnesses and the remaining family. Mr. Thompson used his laptop to show Hughes's film to the witnesses and family members. The film helped to jog the witnesses' memories, and so they provided additional details. The family were grateful dis to discover the fate of their family members. They also confirmed the identity and names of those killed, partially through family photographs. Memory is an important aspect of human rights evidence. It is important for survivors to know what happened, and it helps witnesses to remember what took place. After meeting the family, Mr. Thompson contacted Mr. Hughes with his new information. The names and witnesses were added to the Hughes footage, providing additional metadata about the event. This new information, given to the local community, helped elucidate what took place and gave a local court the evidence needed to identify and convict one of the perpetrators who remained in the area. Based on Mr. Thompson's findings, Mr. Camera Mr. Hughes, the cameraman, returned to Rwanda and filmed a docudrama entitled Isleta, Behind the Roadblock. The movie depicted how the family and their neighbors in this community viewed Hughes' footage, identified the victims and the perpetrators, and then tried him in a local court. Mr. Hughes' documentary and Mr. Thompson's reporting of the story also updated the story of Rwanda, providing further examples of why good electronic evidence is useful to survivors and the outside world, both for healing and retribution. Today, the original footage is available on the Toronto Star website and is archived in the Media and Genocide Archive at Carleton University. This footage is available to scholars and other researchers who seek authentic information about what occurred. This footage is one of the only is one of only three known pieces of footage of the killing that took place in Rwanda over a hundred days in 1994. Archiving the footage ensures it will be available for use into the future. Archiving is an important component of the documentation life cycle that human rights evidence does not always receive. Most important is that Hughes' film captures an actual event as it took place. Being able to clearly show faces and actions establishes what and how an event happened. Details such as the time period in which it took place, the number of people involved in the vehicles used, help to establish the legitimacy of the event as a human rights violation. In this case, the film provides irrefutable proof that people were brutally murdered, how they were murdered, and who murdered them. The fact that these events took place outside on a public street with other people witnessing what occurred underlies its inhumanity and injustice. Having clear details is useful evidence because it helps to fill in what human memory doesn't always retain. Human, human memory is often unreliable when horrific events occur. The chain of custody is well established, the footage is obviously authentic, and the film itself is of good quality. Electronic evidence, the subject of our study, has the potential to provide the same level of quality evidence. Producers of electronic evidence tend to have different motivations and goals, so the types of information they produce are different. Sometimes the intended use of a piece of documentation helps to define its format. For example, a journalist writes a news article, or a government agency collects satellite images. At other times, the evidence is first captured and later used in unanticipated contexts. For example, store security video has been used in human rights or, um, evidence, as has text messages. Human rights electronic evidence is an, any information created or stored in digital format that is relevant for establishing the occurrence of a human rights event. A recording device, a video camera for example, is needed to collect a video testimony. Electronic evidence is primarily collected using computers, cameras, and cell phones. Each form of electronic evidence has its own collection processes and its own issues. To highlight some of the differences, we are going to look at some of these evidence types. Most forms of electronic evidence capture testimonies. These are first-person accounts of particular human rights events recounted by witnesses and victims. Testimony is usually collected after the event has taken place through video, computer, or phones. In countries with little technology infrastructure, they are often collected on paper, handwritten by interviewers, witnesses, victims, and others. Testimonies might then be scanned or typed into a computer system, creating an electronic version of the original. Digital still photographs have always been used in documenting human rights events. In the dangerous or complex situations in which human rights events occur, Digital cameras remove some of the obstacles that am analog cameras had because it does not require film or time to reload. And digital photographs can quickly communicate an event because they are easily and quickly uploaded to the internet for viewing. 
Satellites also produce still images that can be used to establish that a human rights event has taken place. They have been used in Iraq and Bosnia to identify newly tilled soil that was identified by experts to be mass grave sites. Other examples include tracking deforestation on land belonging to indigenous populations and capturing photos of transport vehicles dumping toxic waste. The Gakonda footage is video documentation of a human rights event as it occurred. Such evidence is remarkably compelling. When the human rights organization Witness was still actively collecting content for the hub, they distributed flip cameras, small video cameras to human rights workers and others in vulnerable areas. Cheap, small, handheld cameras have made the option of capturing human rights events possible for many people. For human rights workers, as for anybody, email is commonly used for communication. Human rights abuses that have already taken place are most often the subject matter. In our case studies, the Russian organizations used email most often. Public Verdict is such a group. They use email to communicate with other human rights groups, such as Committee Against Torture, who have brought lawsuits to the European Court of Human Rights, to receive testimony, and they use email lists to disseminate press releases and other information. Text messaging is used quite a bit in on-the-ground human rights situations and events. One reason is that text messaging is often unmonitored and so provides an underground channel for uncensored speech. They are also cheap and quick to send, and they are often forwarded on to others quickly. Text messages have been used to quickly organize and assemble people in protests and riots. In 2001, Philippines President Joseph Estrada was ousted through street protests organized using text messaging. Texting is also used by human rights groups to collect information. PeaceNet established a system of collecting information via text messages for potential conflicts in the Congo. One problem with text messaging is that it is not commonly archived. Recovery of text messages after they have been deleted from a cell phone is not a simple process. Blogging is a way for individuals and organizations to record their own thoughts and ideas in a public forum on a regular basis. Sometimes they use their own websites, sometimes they use blogging services such as Blogger and WordPress. Blogging calls attention to human rights abuses and violence against people seeking to defend or gain their human rights. Blog posts are often reposted in a variety of social media forums and are often used by news agencies and human rights organizations to corroborate human rights events. Web-based communications is a hodgepodge of internet tools and services that are used for creation, communication, and storage of electronic evidence. Primary among these are email services, online word processing tools, social networking sites, online news services, blogs, and news aggregation sites. Human rights organizations also use the internet to off-site and to publicize their campaigns. A social network is a website that allows people, friends, professional groups, and other interest groups to communicate through the internet. The most popular social network is Facebook, but there are many others. Facebook has become popular as a media outlet, particularly in countries where there is widespread government censorship. The media produces many stories, photos, and videos about human rights evidence. According to a recent report by Human Rights Watch, changes in the media world have had an impact on the number of foreign news services. In particular, the number of foreign journalists is in decline, and so the number of stories from professional journalists is decreasing. For this reason, nonprofit organizations have begun to collect, produce, and distribute news stories. Many human rights organizations collect, republish, and analyze these stories. Human rights organizations use news stories to help with publicizing specific human rights violations and identifying those responsible. This is just a brief description of the nature of electronic evidence as seen through the course of this study. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. We're going to turn this over to Sarah Van Dusen Phillips, who will uh, discuss the, the next piece of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as James said, I'm Sarah Van Dusen Phillips, and I am the project coordinator for human rights here at CRL. Um, a brief little background on myself. I came into this project as an anthropologist. Um, and my role was to actually go out into the field and work um, with some of these organizations that we are interested in, in meeting with. So um, this, the last two years I have been involved with in sort of in an intensive study of, of regional human rights organizations in Mexico, par particularly in Chiapas and also in Mexico City, in Rwanda, and, in, um, and then with a colleague in Russia. As James mentioned earlier, we visited between 10 and 12 organizations in each country, um, and these organizations were selected based on 
recommendations through the MacArthur Project, but also through the contacts that we had on the ground. Um, once we met people in each country, they were able to point us to groups that they felt were key um, players in the field of documentation. The goals were to investigate the range of documentation practices used by the groups that we visited in each country um, with a particular focus on digital practices and tools as that is what we're curious about. However, I will say up front that um, digital practices and tools are used by a subset of the groups. Real life on the ground actually requires a lot of um, personal memory, what people hold in their heads, as well as paper documentation. But as documentation moves through its lifespan, and as I hope to de demonstrate to you in the next slides, those documents will become digital documents as there's further need for them. And the second goal was to understand the cultural and infrastructural context shaping di uh, documentation practices. This is especially important when we're considering digital or electronic documentation because in places particularly like Chiapas, Mexico and in Rwanda, a lot of people simply don't have access to the resources and infrastructure necessary for creating digital documentation themselves. So what we will find and what I will show is that there's a collaborative process that takes primary source information, usually paper or memory, and turns it into a digital source later. So what did we find? This slide projects um, or illustrates the general process by which we found that documentation becomes a digital uh, resource in its life course. What you see on the left are three green circles that represent small grassroots organizations or in some cases the smaller subsidiary offices of larger human rights organizations. For example, Human Rights, Inter um, human rights Watch or Amnesty International have subsidiary uh, offices around the world, but then also groups within countries will have a central office and then satellite offices. These groups are the fighters on the ground. They are the activists and the community members trying to get their needs met. And these people document in an ad hoc sort of way. Um, this is often paper documentation, um, although a lot of these groups also keep web pages that draw attention to their plight. The arrows from these small green groups point to a larger yellow circle. This yellow circle represents mid-sized professional organizations or central offices. These are groups that tend to uh, participate in activities like monitoring, education, research and analysis of human rights um, events. And they also collect and standardize documentation in a process of trying to create reports or campaigns that um, alert the rest of the world to what is happening in um, a particular place. And finally, the red box represents the distribution of the, the reports and analyses that the professional organizations create. These documents are often used in courts, governments, at universities for research. They might get stored in libraries, and they go to the media where the world will then learn about what's going on. And these are large um, national and international institutions. So you see things moving from the smaller to the larger. So next I will present briefly three um, case studies, one from uh, each country that I visited, in order to show you how, though these organizations are quite different, the same process of paper or information um, trail. The first organization that I will talk about is the Red Nacional de Organismos Civiles de Derechos Humanos, Todos los Derechos para Todos y Todas, or Red TDT. This is an organization centered in Mexico City. They have pulled together a network of 75 human rights organizations in 22 Mexican states that have agreed to contribute information about the cases that they're working on to a central database that Red TDT holds in Mexico City. This database is based um, on a Heredox human rights thesaurus as a means of identifying and indexing cases. Data are collected from the network organs and are intended for analysis and re of regional and national trends by Red TDT. Reports that are generated are then disseminated out to the world via TDT's website. There's a link there on the slide if you're curious. So what does this sort of network look like? This is a rough sketch of how information travels between organizations for Red TDT. Again, the little green circles are the groups on the ground that represent the 75 organizations. I didn't put all 75 on the slide, that'd be a mess. 
um, to submit, but they submit information directly to Red TDT, but they also might to other um, professional organizations as the blue circle illustrates. That information then goes out through um, analysis and reports and is pushed out to the world. So what you see then is small organizations pushing information forward to the mid-sized organization and then them pushing it out to the world. Next slide, please. In Rwanda, I worked with a group called Ibuka, which was a genocide memorial group. Um, they served two purposes, as a, a site for memory of what happened during the genocide, but also as a current activism group seeking civil and human rights for survivors of the genocide. Ibuka consists of an umbrella organization for a number of other groups focusing on gender rights, um, HIV treatment, legal rights, and diaspora issues. So in addition to its central office in Kigali, Rwanda, it has um, offices around the country and outside of the country. And their three primary objectives are genocide memory, justice, and survivor needs. In terms of how information moves through Ibuka's network, this slide um, Des describes that a little bit. It's a little, um, a little bit sloppier in that what we see is you have Ibuka in Rwanda and then in England, Belgium, and Germany working with survivors in those areas to find documentation, particularly they're interested in government documents that were smuggled out of Rwanda during the genocide. So they get informants to collect government documents, photocopy them, send them to their regional office, the s the s the regional office then sends it to the central Ibuka office in Kigali, represented by the yellow circle. Um, interestingly, all through this process, it's paper documentation. Ibuka keeps paper documentation that it then uses to write reports, news releases, and to even uh, create charges against the government or police for abuses. Those reports are then published and disseminated in hard form through newspapers. But they are also working with the Kigali Memorial Center, which is the purple oval at the top, where they are digitizing their documentation and putting it into a national digital archive to support memory and scholarship. Next slide. Finally, SOVA. Um, which is an organization in Moscow, is a center for information and analysis that focuses on issues of racism, xenophobia, and radical nationalism in the post-Stalinistic era. Um, these, this organization collects data in four areas, news and current events, activities of regional human rights groups, information on um, nationalistic events, in particular um, neo-Nazi rallies, and then they also help manage documentation for legal cases and, and court documents. They have an online news consolidation service that um, human rights re uh, organizations use as a resource for um, other activities around Russia. So SOVA's information flow is similar to the others in that you see SOVA in the large yellow circle. You have smaller organizations um, contributing information directly to SOVA, but SOVA also uh, combs the internet and print media for news related to the three areas that they're interested in and they consolidate that and then put that out through their website in the green box and then from there people from uh, the foreign mass media, from uh, Russian media and from other uh, governments access that news, that targeted news and then are able to understand what is happening um, in terms of human rights events within Russia. So to summarize, in our regional assessment, we found three key findings. First of all, that there's a collaborative networking of documentation. These small groups that have primarily um, verbal or paper accounts of what they've experienced enter into relationships with the mid-sized group, uh, mid-sized more professional groups in order to meet the needs of a campaign or a human rights um, issue that, that they care about. The institutional centralization of this documentation then under, um, supports the standardization and, and digitization of documentation so that it can be used to support research, analysis, further campaigns, justice, etc. This information then moves forward um, from the mid-sized professional groups into larger organizations to serve um, as as information for the rest of the world. And finally, the mid-sized professional organizations serve as network nodes for processing documentation. Not only do they 
do they collect this information, but they process it and often send it back to the small networks, uh, the small organizations, to keep um, information alive and flowing around these human rights issues that people encounter in Russia, Mexico, and Rwanda. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think that's uh, it's a, it's a pretty broad overview, but it's extremely important to note the, the networking and information sharing that goes along, um, as well as the reuse of data for uh, different purposes. Uh, based on uh, Sarah's assessment work and uh, studying the types of documentation that was being used and collected, uh, we've developed a, a generalized model that we're, we're calling the, the life cycle of electronic evidence um, as, a refer as it uh, pertains to human rights information. Um, this is a nice, uh, clean model for your consideration, uh, although in practice it is rarely so straightforward. Um, documentation is um, often, uh, collecting documentation is often haphazard. Uh, a lot of times the information comes without um, proper uh, sourcing. Uh, in some cases the material is, is not really um, uh, useful in, in legal purposes, but it might be useful for advocacy. So I'm just going to walk through this very quickly and then discuss some of these points in detail. At the bottom you can see um, the large orange bar being the creation of documentation. And that might be anything um, that's derived from uh, a human rights uh, event or abuse or violation. Uh, so it, it might pertain to the cell phone videos that are being taken on the street of uh, military uh, uh, personnel uh, shooting to kill. Uh, it might be uh, government uh, policies that have been, been issued uh, in terms of discrimination against a, a particular ethnic or gender uh, class. Um, it might be uh, electronic records that are being produced by corporate governments, um, all sorts of things. Uh, Marie covered very well, I think, the types of electronic evidence. So wherever this information is, is created, uh, eventually it gets filtered up towards human rights organizations. The, the middle, the green bar there that says additional use of documentation is an important acknowledgement that sometimes uh, information may not be recognized as useful for human rights purposes, especially as the concept of human rights continues to evolve over time. Uh, recently, the United Nations recognized the, the right to water as a human right. Uh, so government policies going back for, for decades or even hundreds of years might be called into question at this point as uh, for, for redress for uh, appropriate rights for the individuals. So at the, the point of creation of this information, uh, human rights organizations ideally will have uh, a documentation strategy. That is, they've identified the problem that they want to uh, cover they've identified the um, types of information that they should be looking for, uh, and then they go out and they crawl that information. In some cases, the information comes to them or lands in their lap. Uh, in some cases, they have to go out and file for, um, uh, say, for here in the United States, Freedom of Information Act um, offerings to obtain that kind of documentation. So at the collection stage, um, the material is acquired, um, it's, it's brought into the organization, it's taken a look at. It goes through a series of processes after that, one might say a filtering, um, and an aggregation of information as it works through the life cycle. Authentication is a very important process for, for any one of the, the uses of this material to verify that it is in fact what it purports to be, i.e. not a fake, um, that it um, is, is backed up by other witnesses, uh, that you have a, a chance for um, um, regional or, or, or government offices to respond to the uh, allegations that might be happening. Authentication might also include uh, going out and seeking testimony. The material uh, then goes through, um, in, in many circumstances, through additional organization uh, and classification of information, um, where the types of abuses are documented, um, that uh, the evidence is surrounding that, um, the supporting testimony is collected and organized and put together uh, to, to build a case for um, uh, demonstrating the human rights abuse. Assessment here in this case um, refers to what Sarah was describing. When the larger organizations collect this information and they organize it, they're able to assess larger patterns of abuse, building a case that, that might be um, um, something to um, let the world know about or to pressure public change or to um, affect reparations for communities that have been um, affected. 
and eventually the material goes to what we called, very generally speaking, the output. Whatever the purpose is that the human rights organization has for that type of evidence, when it gets put out into the world and it's achieved its um, goals, that's kind of the end stage of the, the initial life cycle of, of information. Much of this information goes through a process of reuse. Um, that is, once uh, uh, evidence has been created and disseminated for one particular purpose, it might be picked up by different organizations um, for, for use in, in a, uh, another type of um, use case. Or it might go into um, building a new campaign for an organization. And it's also important to acknowledge at the top that <clears throat> a lot of this information um, is, is put out to the world uh, at different stages, whether it's um, the initial event is broadcast on YouTube by um, a particular organization or it's shared among uh, a network in country. Um, the, the dissemination and uh, information sharing applies to uh, both human rights organizations and the media and uh, government officials and uh, international um, officials that are responsible for, for human rights representation. So there's a, a the, the cycle is actually quite um, uh, diverse. It's a, it's a hydra of activity in some cases. So this model is a little bit um, misleading in how, how clean it might be. And we certainly would, would be interested in your feedback on what you've seen in, in your particular um, studies of human rights uh, abuses. In the end, ultimately, the goal is to archive and store the material. Uh, and a lot of times that's done through um, non-professional uh, means, if you will. It's stored on a, a disk or on a hard drive of a computer in their office. Uh, larger human rights organizations have uh, implemented data management plans and content management systems where they can store this information. Um, organizations like Witness have, have created a, a large archive of materials and a, a cataloging thesaurus that they use to, to classify the original materials, any of the documentaries or, sub, or um, derivative materials that they've been produced. So let me just cover just really quickly, as I know we're, we're running low on time, some of these, um, some of these pieces. The collection of information, of course, uh, in the electronic world um, can happen both from external participants or uh, consumer-generated content, as one person uh, described in the, new, in the media or, uh, world. Uh, that this material is being uploaded into YouTube or posted on Twitter or um, uh, shared via Facebook pages. Um, that kind of evidence, uh, as seen here in the, the top right picture of um, demonstrations and protests and uh, the subsequent crackdown in Iran, uh, uh, these, these pictures are somewhat familiar, I think, to all of you by now with people constantly holding up their cell phones, um, multiple sources of the same event. Uh, that's very important for later verification uh, processes. Collected testimony is another way of, of collecting evidence, and the uh, lower image is from the Voices of Rwanda, um, uh, which uh, records testimony uh, in digital form and posts it online uh, to serve as a, uh, the memory of, of the genocide. The second stage, again, authentication, is to verify the information that's going on, and that can happen in different ways, too, in the electronic world. Uh, in some cases, it's... Um, finding the original source of the documentation, who was it that was holding that cell phone, and to identify um, uh, who else was there, who can corroborate that information. The video uh, capture at the top is actually a, a young Syrian man who uh, went on tape with his uh, ID in hand to uh, testify uh, to the world what was happening in his town, a very uh, brave and uh, very dangerous thing to do. Authentication might also happen through um, external sources such as the uh, satellite imagery um, to, to document or back up uh, what on-the-ground witnesses have reported. Uh, in this case, this is a satellite sentinel project um, image that was documenting some of the um, buildup of the military in the region. And a, a famous case um, that has occurred over the past uh, year and a half, two years now, is the Sri Lankan video that was taken by um, at the, at the uh, uh, end of um, the, the, the rebellion there in, in Sri Lanka, there were soldiers who uh, engaged in extrajudicial extra killing uh, and capturing it on their cell phones as they were going. This created quite an uproar when it was originally um, smuggled out of the country and broadcast by the media. Uh, it was picked up by human rights organizations as, as well as the United Nations um, uh, that engaged in an independent investigation. So there was some forensic verification there as well, both looking at um, frame by frame, the videos that were being, uh, that, the video that came out, as well as 
uh, some of the, the physical evidence, uh, such as the guns that were being used, and to test them in live firing to see if they would behave, in fact, in the way that the video showed, to prove that that video was authentic. Organization. Um, a, a number of organizations are quite important to this uh, task, and, and many of the mid-level uh, organizations that Sarah assessed engage in some form of organization and classification of their documents. In any good documentation program, uh, you'll have um, a set of common questions or common uh, um, fields that one will fill out. This screen grab just shows, um, uh, this is uh, from the um, Herodox uh, Open EVSIS, uh, which shows um, the, the types of classifications that one might, might put in to record an event. Uh, they operate under um, a model uh, uh, kind of known colloquially as who did what to whom. So recording the stories uh, to identify who the victims are, who the perpetrators are, what was the nature of the event, detailed descriptions of the information. All of this can be fed into a database that, that can then be um, used for subsequent purposes, such as assessment and output of the information. Um, a number of these content management systems uh, employed by human rights organizations um, can, can sift through the data and report out uh, particular um, cases and concrete evidence to put into advocacy publications, uh, press releases, uh, reports that go to public officials, uh, and, and the like. Increasingly also the means of assessment can be done uh, through citizen uh, media. Uh, this is a, a screen grab of uh, an Ushahidi implementation. If you're not familiar with Ushahidi, it's, um, it's a software that was developed out of, um, coming out of the um, riots after the Kenya elections in 2007, through which citizens can report with their cell phones uh, via SMS uh, incidents of violence or abuse or, or any particular type of, of activity that you want to capture. It was also used um, in relief efforts in Haiti and numerous other cases. All of this information can be sifted into types of, of violations or types of events uh, and visualized on, on maps, in some cases using uh, Google Earth, in some cases using custom information. So that is the life cycle. Uh, and uh, other parts of our, our report um, that I, I don't really have much time to discuss here but uh, will be issued online in our final report is how this material it was being used, for what particular purposes was this evidence collected, and in what uh, what were the requirements for the um, documentation or the metadata generation for that information? Um, so in an advocacy campaign, when, it, when a human rights organization is interested in um, pumping out information on the web, uh, stop the violence now, or something to that effect, um, what kind of verification do they go through for their, their electronic documentation? What kind of uh, information is, is typed into the fields that would allow somebody to see when was this taken, where was this taken, who does it represent, um, who were the perpetrators, uh, and, and how do those organizations back that information up. Uh, for further downstream purposes such as um, legal uses or for scholarship, there are different requirements for that type of metadata. Things such as making sure you document the chain of custody of the original piece of evidence um, so that at all times you can account for um, how it, that that is in fact what it what it represents to be. Numerous challenges in legal cases um, go to um, the evidence being thrown out because um, although this cell phone video was was generated, you actually have no idea um, who took it, um, what formats it was migrated in, um, who had their hands on it before you can use it in evidence. So that might be important for an advocate, but ultimately not usable in a court of law. I just wanted to touch on, on two uh, important parts of our study which are already online on our website. And they were specific uh, reports commissioned to discuss the legal requirements of electronic evidence. Um, that is, what, what were the, um, the issues that our electronic evidence faces when being used in courts of law? Uh, two reports that we have, um, and I won't go into detail here in the interest of, of making sure we have some time for discussion, um, include uh, a report by Lucy Thompson, uh, who was instrumental in our uh, original conception of, of this proposal. And she uh, wrote a report about the admissibility of electronic documentation as evidence in U.S. courts. Uh, and uh, she goes into detail in her report, her lengthy report, about the types of uh, factors that go into 
deciding whether a piece of evidence is admissible. Uh, in fact, electronic documentation uh, has, the, in effect, the same rules of admissibility as normal documentation. But there are additional challenges that can be raised along the way. Uh, and aside from the issue of is this relevant to the um, proceedings, you know, I, one needs to be careful to document the authenticity of this material. Um, can you, in fact, verify who it was that captured this information? Uh, do you have witnesses that can testify as to the events taking place in a video? Or could represent that computer output is, in fact, what the system would be reasonably expected to generate? Rules of hearsay, of course, um, mean any, any kind of testimony that was conducted outside of sworn testimony um, needs to be backed up. Uh, and, and that uh, is sometimes very difficult with electronic information uh, and several other factors that go around. So authentication is a very, very um, important factor with electronic documentation. And Lucy's report goes on to recommend um, that uh, documentation about the aspects of evidence need to be kept um, throughout the entire process. That is, as early as possible, even on the scene, um, somebody needs to make sure that the evidence uh, correctly describes what it is, um, uh, the devices it was taken on, the formats that it's put into, uh, and handed on down the chain in a responsible manner. Uh, responsible here, of course, includes uh, looking out for the, securities of the security of the individuals that might be represented in that evidence. Um, the victims uh, uh, being one, the photo taker or the, the documenter being another one, and the crowd, of course, that is surrounding them in some of these cases, the crowds that are attending a demonstration. Um, uh, do they really, uh, obviously, they probably have not given their consent to be recorded on a video device, uh, and that might further imperil them down the road. The second report about legal requirements of electronic evidence was commissioned um, from the uh, the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Uh, they were looking very specifically at the uh, use of electronic evidence in human rights investigations and prosecutions, particularly in international courts of law. So these two reports complement each other uh, in terms of uh, the types of, of rules, uh, the types of considerations that go into the use of electronic evidence, uh, and in particular with the, the criminal courts, uh, as electronic evidence is now just beginning to um, be a factor, since a number of these court, uh, court cases deal with events that have happened decades ago, the number of things that, that the courts will have to decide along the way. Uh, some of the, uh, most of the challenges are very similar to the ones in the U.S. courts of law. Uh, in the international criminal courts, however, um, the, the, there's no jury, uh, so the, the probative value or the prejudicial value of evidence sometimes is not as much a consideration. Uh, in fact, the, the rules of hearsay may not be as important factors in there. Um, the general consensus was the admissibility of this evidence is a fairly low bar. Anything that seems to, on its face, represent um, what the, the prosecutor or the defender um, re represents it to be might be admitted into evidence, but later on the, uh, uh, the authenticity, the, the lack of foundation, the relevance of the material is weighed as part of the, um, the, the weight of the evidence rather than at the initial stage of admissibility. Their re recommendations were very similar to Lucy Thompson's um, that um, the documentation uh, from the outset is very important, that you need to make sure that you have contextual information to back up your material. Um, that, that is, you know, um, um, you know, what was going on, what are the events, why, why this was taken, um, that sort of thing. And that uh, the internal indicators of electronic evidence, such as the metadata um, that's embedded in a photo, these are all important uh, factors, but of course the witness testimony goes to the greatest weight of evidence at that point. Finally, I just want to um, really what this means for, for academic uh, research libraries, um, why we undertook this in the first place. Uh, increasingly, well, traditionally, of course, um, there's been a great interest in human rights studies, uh, and uh, this impacts not just um, the law schools, but uh, human, uh, humanities and social sciences research as well. Media studies uh, increasingly is looking at human rights impact uh, and, and the use of technology in ICT. Um, the role of the research institutions that we looked at generally comprised three main areas. One is um, 
preserving the materials generated by these organizations or individuals. Uh, and a number of academic institutions are now taking in the corporate records, um, I shouldn't say corporate for a nonprofit, but uh, you, you know what I mean, the corporate information from Human Rights Watch or the um, International Center for Transitional Justice. Um, and, and maintaining that material, not just for um, um, the events that occurred, but the decisions that were made at the time uh, that, that the organization decided to pursue an advocacy campaign, et cetera. Um, preserving the online record uh, of the organization and of human rights events as well. Um, there's a number of web archiving activities that are underway, both at Columbia University and the University of Texas, who are capturing um, institutional web pages, um, events as they happen. Archive-It is also playing a role in this uh, as various partners with Archive-It, um, which is a web archiving service, um, have been capturing sites, uh, YouTube videos, Twitter feeds and the like, uh, relating to various protests in the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, uh, and um, Eastern Europe, just for example, some of the cases. And finally, a third type is active collaboration with the institutions on the preservation of the primary source material, that is the, the evidence that is being um, collected and stored by these organizations. And the University of Texas's Human Rights Documentation Initiative is one of those um, projects that's underway. Um, we, we had uh, invited them to participate in this call and unfortunately we had some conflicts, but they did send some interesting slides that we did want to highlight. Um, the work of the Human Rights Documentation Initiative there is the long-term preservation of the records of the human rights struggle. Um, they work uh, on the ground with organizations in, in uh, Rwanda, in Burma, and other areas uh, to preserve and uh, manage the, the, the long-term um, value of the, the documentation. They represent what they call a non-custodial archives model. That is, they're not taking the physical evidence home uh, for future study, which is uh, kind of a, um, a, a, the colonial model of collection, but they're working with the organizations to preserve it on the ground and to uh, make it digitally available uh, where scholars in the United States um, can have access. They um, received, a, uh, you may have seen in the news, a large file about, um, um, that's going to be upwards of six million pages, I think, of the Guatemalan um, police archives. So they support the local capacity to, and they, they seek to improve access to this material. Some of the work that they've done um, in the electronic realm is quite interesting. They've been working on developing standards um, uh, for metadata for human rights documentation. Uh, and uh, they've been working uh, sort of from the, the library and archival perspective on this uh, in terms of adapting the, the existing and familiar metadata standards towards uh, human rights documentation. Two of the things that they've recently come out with um, are metadata guidelines for video uh, and metadata guidelines for audio. Uh, these uh, links here can point you to more information about that and there's uh, a variety of additional information on the University of Texas's uh, website about this. Some of the upcoming information um, that they're, they're working on in 2012 is uh, human rights, um, uh, a human rights documentation thesaurus um, for the University of Texas program, as well as metadata guidelines for archived websites. So looking at the, the proper description, cataloging and organization of this material. Uh, we've put their contact up there if you're interested in more of their um, resources. Finally, I just want to point out two things on our website. Um, one is um, our recent issue of Focus, uh, if we can go to the web. Um, at, on our homepage, uh, we just released this week uh, the, uh, our, our latest quarterly issue of Focus, uh, which is our, our newsletter that uh, relates to the types of uh, activities and collections that CRL uh, engages in. Here on our screen, you'll see the quarter is devoted to human rights documentation, where you can see some of the information that um, is being produced by this report, um, as well as some of the other activities underway. Here's the Guatemalan uh, archives, as I just described, and CRL's recent work with the, um, the uh, the federal prosecutors in Brazil to digitize the Brazil Nunca Mais um, documentation that was collected by the Latin American Microform Project here at CRL. So these are all important and interesting articles. I do commend them to you. The second thing I want to point out on our site is our topic guide on human rights. Uh, as you know, we uh, keep collections of uh, physical and electronic materials here at the center. And the topic guides are a good gain access to the types of materials and activities uh, that, that uh, CRL engages in. Our human rights topic guide was developed um, a, a little while ago, but it's 
valuable, I think, for you to take a look at. Um, it describes several things uh, relating to the collection of human rights documentation, what CRL has, and other resources that you might be able to, um, that you might be interested in. This is where we'll post a link to our final report, which should be up within the next two weeks. Um, already here at the, um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see a link to the Human Rights Electronic Resources Study, um, where those legal reports that I referred to, as well as some of our uh, case studies and our interim report is presently available. The final report will be up there soon. I didn't leave a lot of time for discussion, but we have about five minutes. Um, so if you have any uh, questions that you have submitted via the chat or would like to unmute your phone, um, you can press star six to unmute your phone and ask any questions. We did have um, one question about uh, websites that would archive human rights documentation. Uh, and I think that we posted uh, some information about that um, here in our slide. Uh, we can, we'll gladly send you out the links, but if you look at both the University of Texas's Human Rights Documentation Initiative or uh, type in Columbia Human Rights Web Archive, uh, you'll pull up information on both of those projects. Archive it as well. Um, uh, has a number of collections related to uh, the Middle East, which contains human rights documentation. Um, so that, that is that. Uh, one uh, question came in about uh, the, the issues of security uh, related to our work. Did we feel in danger in collecting the information? Sarah, maybe you want to address some of the, the on-the-ground concerns that we had as we went along. Um, that's uh, danger. That's an excellent question. Of course, human rights workers themselves are constantly putting themselves in danger. Did I feel in danger? Sometimes, yes, actually. When I was in Chiapas, um, I had a person I was working close with who kept me out of harm's way, but I did have to negotiate um, military checkpoints. And while I was there, um, events, violent events by paramilitary groups happened around me, though I was never in the line of fire. So um, that was a consideration. In Rwanda, Actually, I never really did feel unsafe. The group that I was working with insulated me um, pretty carefully from, from the rest of life on the ground there. Although I, spending time in Rwanda, I did see things happening to others that, uh, or that had happened to others that, that made me very uncomfortable, but I don't think I was ever in um, any physical danger there. Um, but danger is, is a problem for the people working there. Obviously, they have sensitive information. Um, in Rwanda, they have to deal with people who um, claim that the, the genocide never happened, and they try to reinforce that claim violently. Um, and in Chiapas, there are constant clashes between indigenous people and the government. And sometimes they're the form of a peaceful protest, but other times it's actual, you know, violence between police or military and um, village residents. So it, it is a constant problem. And I can say from my own perspective, I was uh, safely ensconced behind my computer screen for much of this study, uh, but I, I did suffer a, a number of potential dangerous viruses by visiting all of these websites. So that was, that was my own personal harrowing story on this project. Well, we're coming up towards the end of the hour. Um, I do encourage you to submit your thoughts um, to us uh, as we go along. I did want to just acknowledge very quickly our um, advisory committee um, that, that helped us on this project. Uh, a number of um, incredibly brilliant individuals who helped um, work through some of these issues and to, to help us work through our models and to discuss some of the challenges along the way. Um, uh, they're listed here, too many to mention um, by phone. Um, but I also wanted just to give you our contact information um, in case you had any follow-on questions. Um, our, our contact information is here at the end of the slides. It's also available on CRL's website. Um, and, and these slides will be made available online um, um, as we go. Just a, a plug, I guess, for a couple of upcoming events here. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars uh, not related to human rights, but also equally interesting, I'm sure, to, uh, to our community. Our print archives and Pre preservation registry webinar will be conducted in about a month from now. Um, we have a, a special topic about interlibrary loan at CRL uh, in March. Uh, and our general collections and services, one coming up in June. Also, uh, our 2012 annual members council meeting 
and Collections Forum will be a live event this year. Um, it will be conducted here in Chicago April 19th and 20th. Um, invitations have gone out to the library directors. There's more information on our website. Um, this is the major event of CRL's uh, year where we're discussing uh, our, our strategy moving forward for the next several years, uh, and your feedback would be most welcome uh, at that as well. We will send out the survey for this to see um, whether you thought this was interesting and useful um, or what particular questions you might have, what you would learn more about. Uh, and this pres presentation will be posted on CRL's um, website as well as on our YouTube page. To get more information about CRL, sign up for CRL Connect. You'll get our uh, bi-weekly-ish uh, newsletter about current events and activities happening here at CRL, and pass that along to colleagues that you think might be interested in our work as well. Thank you so much, and have a nice afternoon.